Prima Media's Engineering News and Mining Weekly is interviewing Charles DeSantos, the Managing Director of Air Products, who is attending South Africa's far-reaching Green Hydrogen Summit, which has attracted impressive global attention. Charles, Engineering News and Mining Weekly can report that Air Products South Africa, which I think was founded in our country as long ago as 1969, has been a faithful manufacturer, supplier, distributor of a wide variety of industrial and specialty gas products to the Southern African region for many decades. So I just want to say it's great to chat to you, Charles. And Engineering News and Mining Weekly would like to kick off this key interview by putting this opening question to you. What is the big green hydrogen message that air products would like to put across at this critical time of global climate change concern? No, thank you for the opportunity, Martin, and uh, for us to give uh, our views and uh, share our uh, insights uh, with you. Um, so the green hydrogen economy has been spoken about with a lot of great hype in recent uh, years. And uh, one element of, let's call it reality, that seems to be hitting uh, the marketplace is the economics don't make a lot of sense yet. And yes, there's a lot of uh, economic drivers in some regions of the world, especially from the European countries, um, to progress the green hydrogen economy and they are supporting projects. But at the end of the day, fundamentally, projects have got to be able to stand on their own two feet. Yes, it does need a lot of injection to get the economy developed, but once it's rolling out, it should be able to stand on its own two feet. The challenge we have in South Africa is that we've got all the right credentials in terms of resources in renewables, in terms of uh, our platinum, in terms of the, just the, the ability to generate the large amounts of energy that are required to produce the green hydrogen and whatever derivatives thereof. But we do face some challenges. The, de the global demand at this point in time is still very, very low, almost non-existent for the, for the purposes of... And that is still going to take some time to develop. So we mustn't be too enthusiastic to, let's call it, look at the mega scale projects. If anything, if we had to do more than one mega scale project in South Africa in, in this decade, we'll probably overextending ourselves because all that's going to happen with the, with the demand still being at its infancy stage, you're going to have the two part, let's say two or three projects, if you had a, that going, uh, eating each other's lunch because they will not all survive with the demand at the levels that it is now. It will come. And I'm very confident with South Africa's credentials, we're going to be a lead player in the green hydrogen economy globally. But it's a big timing issue as to when do you step in and how do you... Uh, develop that economy. And why I mean in terms of developing it, I'm actually alluding that we should strongly focus on developing a local green hydrogen economy. And from that, it's very easy to piggyback global developments and to build on or to top up whatever we do locally. And where in the world is air products involved in the generation, the actual generation of green hydrogen, and what good is that doing for the regions where it's being used? So at this point in time, um, green hydrogen at scale is only being developed or it's still in, uh, the project is not on stream yet, uh, by air products in uh, Neom in Saudi Arabia. So that product that is produced, it will be green ammonia, will be shipped mostly to Europe. And then from there, the ammonia will be cracked back into green hydrogen. 
and then distribute it throughout the European market for what a need and purpose it is. It could be to existing consumers. There's an extensive pipeline network that will be fed with this uh, green hydrogen. There's existing distribution networks for, for hydrogen already that will be then supplied with green hydrogen. So the, the end user varies from your industrial users, your chemicals, your uh, petrochemicals, and the new area, which is still in its infancy stage, mobility. Now, there's a lot of hype around mobility, and it really has great potential. But if you think you're converting one truck at a time, at this point in time, the, the fuel cell trucks are not mass produced at the level that would uh, substantially create a demand. And secondly, the cost of those fuel cell trucks, because they're not mass produced yet, is still very high. So the economics of the mobility side will take a while to really grow. So it has a huge impact on reducing carbon emissions. But I must state, although, every part of the chain requires energy. So yes, you can produce it green in, uh, let's say, the Middle East, but you require energy to move it to Europe. And once you're in Europe, you require the energy to distribute it. So that starts to eat away at the, the energy value that you created. And I'm going to refer that back to a South African scenario. If we can use the energy where we need it and where we create it, you actually save on that value chain tremendously. And why is green hydrogen regarded increasingly as the only compelling option to abate climate concerns credibly? So uh, there's absolutely no carbon footprint as a result of the, the emissions themselves. What you have in the value chain in terms of the, the supply chain might start to impact the, depending on how you're transporting that around, both locally and over long distances. How you do that may have some carbon footprint. So, uh, but the, the, the proposition is essentially you're starting with 100% green solar, wind, converting that to green hydrogen with, as, as I said, the proviso that we've got to look at the, the supply chain very carefully to see how green you can maintain that. And do you agree that there is a market for green hydrogen? It's there as a replacement for grey hydrogen. Grey hydrogen is there in the chemical business, given that more than 100 million tons of this heavily polluting hydrogen is already in widespread global use in the manufacture of, for example, inks, paints, plastics, in fertilizer, and you name it. That touches on the point I made earlier, is that if you can create, to a certain extent, a significant baseload with either existing users or high volume users, that has a huge impact in, let's call it, motivating the economic development and the economic success of a particular project. So uh, at base load is where it exists. And uh, we're fortunate in South Africa to have companies like Sassel and others who are already large consumers of hydrogen. That gives us a base load opportunity so that when you do generate this green hydrogen, there's already a outlet and you don't have to wait for the the longer term developments that uh, you would need for this, for example, the mobility case, which is a great case. It's just time and effort that's going to be required to develop it. Then also in other areas where new technologies have to be still be developed or commercialized rather than necessarily developed. So for instance, going through to uh, green steel, there's still development work need to be done before that becomes a reality. But the here and now, there are opportunities immediately to produce green ammonia or uh, do refining using green hydrogen. Or um, as we do in the, the steel industry, we supply for atmospheric uh, inerting almost uh, environments that, where it's, where that, that could immediately change to 
green hydrogen without investment being needed in the end user operation. And finally, Charles, what's the big takeaway? In the South African context, I think we have a opportunity to develop our own hydrogen economy without a dependency on the global dynamics. And I think with all the focus on the global opportunities, we're missing out and on the effort, which isn't being exploited to the extent I believe it can be, to create that local green hydrogen economy. And with a, a more focused effort in that area, we can actually create an environment here where we may even take the lead in global terms because you're not dependent on economies that are, let's call it, far flung from us. And secondly, the, the, the issue beyond that is that there's going to be a lot of other economies competing against us. Because in the short term, while demand remains relatively low, uh, South Africa is, a, is one of the more distant sources from the markets. So you've got uh, North Africa, Middle East being far much closer to the European market and Australia being closer to the Japanese market. So let's focus on our own market and those, those global markets look to diversify the risk of their supply chain, um, we will participate in it. It's inevitable. We will be competitive in those markets. But in the short term, we should rather focus on our own localized requirement than relying on international demand to create a justification for mo the multiple projects that we're looking at uh, in, the, in the region, in both South Africa and Namibia, especially we will be competing against the likes of the North African and Middle Eastern regions, which have uh, a slight advantage because of the geographic distance to the markets in the early stages. That was Creamer Media's Engineering News and Mining Weekly, speaking to Charles DeSantos, the Managing Director of Air Products 